Welcome to Let's Get Writing Author Reads. I'm your host, Katherine Taylor, and with me is Bridget Canning. Hi, Bridget. Hi. This is the part where you get to do some work. You get to do some reading, and I'm excited. I always like to hear authors read their own work because I think they know it best. How do you feel about it? I, I like it. Uh, I have to say, I know I have lots of friends who are writers who hate doing readings and stuff like that. But I actually, I, 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 I think it's kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, and uh, it's almost like, so she seems, you know, I haven't read it for a while. So it's like, it's a person, you know what, I like this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. true. When you read your own work and you, if you haven't read it for a while, you go, this is not too bad. This is not as what I thought it would be. Do you find that it distances you a bit from your work? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's, I think that's what happens a lot with writing is you kind of, you almost forgot, you almost forgot it's like this life that you lived and now it's, you know, you've, you're just moving on somewhere else. So it's kind of like, um, uh, yeah, it's, 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 I think it's like a memory trick. Like you almost start remembering things that you mm -hmm. were thinking at the original, you know, originally when you, you came up with the ideas. So it's kind of, a. um, uh, it's almost like you're reading it to yourself. It's almost like you kind of are discovering mm. something else about yourself. I know it sounds cheesy, but oh, well, anyways, it's, yeah, it's no, often like said if you're writing, take that break and read your read your writing out loud because it has a different feel. It gives you sort of, I guess, the rhythm. No, it just it's kind of a nice thing to do. And here's the book from which Bridget is going to read. There we go. It's some people's children which is your recent book and it's just been nominated for if i say this right the thomas Riddell. did yes. i pronounce that correctly the thomas Riddell atlantic fiction award the biggest award east of ontario and a significant significant one so certainly wish you all the best with that and it's quite an honor for you thank you so much well let's hear from you i'm going to disappear off screen okay. and you can set the mood for us and take us away for a little while. Okay, great. Well, hi, everybody. I'm going to read part of chapter two uh, from my novel, Some People's Children. Just before I do that, I just want to give a shout out to Breakwater um, who and Rhonda Malloy Breakwater, who does, uh, I love this cover. Uh, who So she does the layout for all the books. And uh, this artwork is a piece uh, by, um, by Mike Goff, who's one of my favorite Newfoundland artists. Um, so anyway, thanks for letting me use your work, Mike Goff. <laughs> Very happy with the cover. Okay, so I'm reading a little bit of chapter two. Uh, at this point, uh, so Imogene, this, the novel, this novel is kind of a coming of age story and the protagonist, Imogene Tubbs, is, I believe she's about 11, year, 11 or 12 years old here. Um, and she's just kind of found out that she may not have been what's been told to her about her father doesn't seem like anyone actually believes that so this is what you know so in in this part of the chapter she's kind of thinking of you know this this kind of shows us uh, her state of mind and um, a bit of a background on her family okay chapter two in class sister patricia gives an assignment which everyone fails it is a list of directions one Read all instructions before doing anything. Two, get out of your desk and stand on one foot. Three, hop up and down on one foot. Four, stop hopping and fold your arms. Three, nod five, sorry, five, nod three times. Six, spin around. Seven, whistle. Eight, clap your hands. Nine, sit down. Number 10, wait for the teacher to say go before doing directions two to nine. And so on. Everyone hops and bops and laughs. Afterwards, Sister Patricia announces that they have all failed because they didn't read and pay attention to the first and last directions. She hopes this will teach everyone to pay closer attention. You people would have learned what the activity was all about if you just paid attention, she says. Imogene didn't read the list well, but in general, she has been paying more attention to everything since overhearing Nan and Great Aunt Bride. Last week, when she was with Nan in the post office, Marie Whalen looked her up and down. Which one are you, she says. She said, Eli's girl? No, this is Imogene, Nan said. Marie's eyes met hers and there was a sharp click of recognition. Oh yes, young Maggie's child. Nan's mouth made a sharp line. She nodded to Marie and collected the flyers in silence. Imogene will have to listen hard because she only knows four things about her father and no one talks about him. 
Last Christmas, when Maggie was home, Imogene asked her about him and received another version of the four things. And then Maggie cried and said she was sorry. These are the four things Imogene knows. Number one, her father's name is Anthony Green. His name is on her birth certificate. Number two, he was a young fisherman who worked on the crab boats for a season. He and Maggie started going out. She told him she was older than what she was. When he found out she was underage, he disappeared. Number three, Nan sent letters to his old employer looking for him. There was no response. The letters were sent to Marystown, where he moved after St. Felix's. The last letter was returned from the employer saying Anthony moved away. No forwarding address. Number four, Anthony told Maggie he was from Port of Basque, but according to Nan, no one, no one there named Green knows anything about him. Anthony Green is spoke of in blasphemous tones. He is unmentionable, like dirty underwear and the secret name of God. And Maggie went to work in St. John's when Imogene was about four, and then Ontario, and now she can only come home once or twice a year. When she's home, every day is an event, and it never seems a good time to request more information. Imogene's memories of Maggie are like a vine, which grew straight at first, and then sprouted branches, spreading in all directions. Her earliest recollections are lying next to Maggie, waking to the shape of her, of the shape of her back and cloak of black hair. Maggie's arms swinging hers as they danced on the carpet to Abba songs. And then came the calm explanations. Mommy will only be gone a little while. See the square in the calendar? This is when Mommy comes home. She'll call you all the time on the phone and tell you stories. She'll have presents for you. Then Maggie's pink streaming face. Maggie lifting her suitcase. Nan prying the damp hem of Maggie's red sweater out of Imogene's fists. Maggie's brown hair whipping straight up in the wind as she walks to Uncle Eli's truck. Her shoulders quaking. And then everything was busy. Legos with Rita on Aunt Trudy and Uncle Eli's rug, being pushed on the swing in their backyard, whispering with Rita over their sleeping dolls, <clears throat> being scolded as a pair. Good girls share. Good girls don't fight. Nan lying on the couch with a damp face cloth on her eyes. Imogene, go over to Eli's for a bit. It's their turn. Uncle Kenneth got Maggie a job in St. John's. She stayed with him to save money, working at the purity factory all day and finishing her GED at night. Then it was secretarial courses and a new plan. When there was enough money, Imogene would join her. Imogene recalls the house changing whenever Maggie was home, the way it smelled like love's baby soft and watermelon-scented watermelon hairspray. Eli's truck rumbling down the driveway and Maggie bursting in to sweep her up, her long dark hair over her shoulders, her brightly colored clothes. Maggie pulling gifts from bags, chocolates, new shoes, a copy of the Velveteen Rabbit. And then school and firmer, more concrete events. Maggie home for Christmas. Imogene and asked Santa for a puppy, a golden retriever. There was one on a long distance telephone commercial where two blonde children open a big box and the puppy bounds out. She remembers Maggie handing her a box and inside a stuffed toy dog. Oh, Imogene said, that's not the kind of puppy I wanted. Maggie shrugging, your letter to Santa said puppy. It didn't say what kind. A summer visit. Maggie's legs long in jeans with patches and zippers, giving Imogene a piggyback ride down to Frenchbrook, pretending to throw Imogene in the water. Mommy, no, Imogene screeched, and Maggie's fingers stiff in her armpits as she was deposited on the grass. I was only playing, Imogene. And the boyfriend she brought home when Imogene was seven, Shane Hearn. He had eyebrows like caterpillars and black curly hair that was long in the back. He wouldn't stop tickling Imogene's feet. He'd sweep her up on his lap as she walked past and then pin her arms to her side with one hand and tickle her feet. Every time she squealed and kicked and said no. And he said things like, you like it, you're laughing. And twice he did it when she was at night at nighttime when she was going to pee and she was ready for bed in her nightie. She wanted to kick out at him, but was too scared he would see she didn't wear underwear to bed. He stopped the evening Imogene wouldn't kiss him goodnight. That was the routine. She'd kiss Nan goodnight and any other relatives in the house when she was going to bed. Nan, Maggie, and Shane sat in the living room. She kissed Nan and Maggie and then froze in front of Shane. He held open his arms to her. Where's my goodnight kiss? And her legs wouldn't move. Imogene, Maggie said, don't be rude. But Nan spoke with a hollow darkness. That's okay, Imogene, my love. You go on to bed. After Shane, there was Robert Cronin. 
She remembers a visit to St. John's, her and Nan on the bus, Robert taking them all to Ponderosa, the back of his giant head in front of her on the Trinity train loop. And afterwards, a change in plan. Robert would return to Ontario to start his own real estate company. Maggie would help him organize it. Imogene would join them when they were set up. That summer was a long visit with both Maggie and Robert. Imogene was going into grade four, and it was the first time she heard the word quaint. The way Robert used to talk about everything in St. Felix's. The houses were quaint. The church was quaint. The school was quaint. But when Rita, Wish Benoit, and Natalie Sampson came over the play, they weren't quaint. Don't go jumping on the furniture, he said. And this was a strange thing to say because it hadn't crossed their minds at all. Wish laughed. We aren't monkeys, he said. Robert said it wasn't funny. Robert talked about Ontario all the time, the way the houses are made of brick there. And it's so strange there wouldn't be brick houses in a place called The Rock. He said things like, why don't people use garbage cans instead of wooden boxes? It's like everyone has a bread box for their trash. And it's too bad you can't sell beauty. It's the only way this place wouldn't be poor. When Robert talked, Maggie laughed a lot, and Nan squeezed and released her fingers over and over. In the fall, Imogene's Ontario move kept changing time frames. It would happen once the house was sorted out, once the office was organized, once their client base is established. Finally, Nan said, no, it's too much to yank her out of school, she said. She's got roots here. Sheldon Cleary says they hold youngsters from Newfoundland back a grade when you move up. It's not fair. And all talk of it ended. Now it's phone calls and maybe two visits a year. Now it's the name Maggie spoken more often than your mother. Thank you very much. Um, you know, when I, um, let's go back up here. When you're reading that and when I read it, I actually, I, I, you know, I kept going back to that book. I wanted to keep reading more and more as she grew up and evolved through things. But so often it did happen because I, I think where kids were sometimes displaced mm -hmm. because of the way Outport Newfoundland is like parents can't find work there. Nan is often a big role in, in raising kids. I've seen it time and time again. It's not oh. that unfamiliar to people here that uh, parenting is more than, you know, in an ideal situation, it's mom and dad, but it's not always an ideal situation. People need work. They have to move for work. Kids, sometimes you can't take them around everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's my spiel on that. But, uh, you know, it did It did seem like a familiar feeling. I can just imagine poor Imogene, how, how she felt. Mm. I think a lot of people, too, like are, uh, um, like my, my parents' generation, my father's generation, it was quite common for maybe the first child, like if you had a big family, the first child would be raised by the grandparents, um, especially if they, like, you know, people got married or maybe they got married really fast for a reason. And then you mm -hmm. had this, you know, like, so people, like, so a young couple would just be setting up their life together and the first child would end up, you know, living, you know, being taken care of the grandparents. And then, of course, they would have a very different uh, experience growing up than the rest of the children. Absolutely. And it's not like there would be a lot of daycares. Or, you have to think that a lot of these communities are semi-isolated or certainly very small. Mm -hmm. So the, the formal systems you might think that you would have in a city don't exist. And, and that common thing of people going to Ontario for work, well, I mean, it still ha happens now, Ontario, yeah. out west. Certainly COVID's put a bit of a, a stress on that too, I'm sure. We'll probably see stories about that coming out too. Yeah. So Bridget, you said you do like doing readings and that was really enjoyable. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah. So thank you so much for doing that. And we did have one comment from Samantha Fitzpatrick, um, which I put up and uh, thank you, Samantha, so much. She loved the book. Thanks, Samantha. <laughs> yeah. And so what's coming up next for you, Bridget? Do you have some short stories coming out perhaps? Um, I do have a short story collection, uh, unofficially, uh, that is, that hopefully will make it manifest that will hopefully become a real thing. Uh, so my third book will be a short story collection, which hopefully will be out in 2022, but I, nothing has been, you know, uh, nothing, like that, that it, it, it's, 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 it's being talked about, but it hasn't, mm -hmm. uh, the ball hasn't started rolling on that yet. So hopefully. Well, we'll be looking forward to that and wish you all the best in your writing 
in your writing <laughs> adventures. And, uh, and maybe someday you'll go crazy and redecorate that office. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> you have to watch the I other did part. put wallpaper up. I did put wallpaper up. <laughs> over over here yeah uh -huh. that was i'm not a, it, it's it's a it looks okay from a distance <laughs> i think it looks very nice it almost has a, an oriental sort of look to it you know that's dog berries actually it's dog berries uh, newfoundland berry is it a newfoundland wallpaper we digress no no it's it's not but i i got pretty excited about the dog berries so excellent yeah the theme well bridget let's jump over on to instagram and have another short chat and let people know what we've been doing and for everyone who's watching this i hope you enjoyed bridget's reading i hope you enjoy her books we've got both of them here the greatest hits of one to james and she was reading from some people's children and um, we're going to have a little more to talk about, and we'll have links below for everything. And don't forget to check out her full interview on Let's Get Writing. Thank you so much, Bridget. Let's say goodbye again. Thank you, Thank <laughs> goodbye, you so much. Everyone. Have a great day.